Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Corey Rosen, and you are listening to the Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super guest, Mister Miss, Mister Doctor Doctor. Doctor. That's <laughs> even better, Doctor <laughs> Mariah Thompson Corley, BM of University of Alberta MMDMA, the Juilliard School. Once born in Jamaica and raised in Canada, she has performed internationally as both a solo and collaborative artist at venues including the Smithsonian Muse- Museum of African American History, the Badaris Festival, List Academy, Carnegie Recital Hall, and Aaron Davis Hall. Among her collaborators are Mel- Metropolitan Opera Soprano Priscilla Baskerville, Juno Award winning clarinetist James Campbell, Grammy Award winning clarinetist Doris Paul Galati, friend of the show. Grammy nominated baritone Randall Scarlatta, renowned countertenor Daryl Taylor, and members of the New York Philharmonic and Philadelphia Orchestras. Maria, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mouthful. It is a mouthful. Yeah. So, you were born in Jamaica, raised in Canada. Where did music fall into your life? Oh, um, from the very beginning, I would say, um, you know, my grandmother was a graduate of the New England Conservatory as a piano major and performance major. Um, That's the Bermuda side of my family, my mom's side. And uh, my mom was a piano teacher and she taught each of her kids. So I had uh, an older brother who was studying, first of all. And I guess from the time I was two, I wanted to learn to play. So um, she made me wait till I was four. And then I've been playing the so was it, how did you, did you start writing music or did you take lessons or? Um, in composition, uh, that, uh, I took a year of composition when I was about 14, 13, 14. Mm-hmm. And um, that's my only formal compositional training. Um, but I was writing little pieces. Um, I remembered later that my brother, who was um, an actor and dir- uh, aspiring director, very talented, um, would make super eight movies. And so he would ask me to do the film scores, like to come up with music to go uh, or find music, you know, like we'd play sometimes records that I thought the music fit a certain scene. So I was doing that from, I think, before, certainly before puberty. <laughs> so I don't know if I was 10 or nine or something, but, you know, doing things like that. Um, and it's funny, I didn't think of myself as a composer until quite recently. It just seemed like, um, I don't know why it wasn't on my radar. It was, I mean, I don't know if it was because I hadn't gotten a lot of training, but, you know, when I was a teenager, I was writing pop songs, which, you know, I didn't really know what to do with to put them anywhere. But um, so coming up with melodies and, and uh, musical ideas was never difficult. But I um, I started arranging, first of all, um, and this was just for fun. Um, friends, uh, we had all gone to college and came back for Christmas and my mom was the uh, music director and organist at um, the church where I, I grew up grew up going. And so um, I came up with this idea of arranging in the bleak midwinter for us to do as an acapella, um, sort of in the style of take six. Mm. And um, that's the first arrangement that I can recall writing down, which interest, I think I was about 20, somewhere in the range of 20, 21. And um Quite recently, a group called Musica Intima, um, based in Canada, discovered this uh, arrangement. You know, I, I, I didn't have a recording of it, but I guess they were looking for things by uh, Canadian composers or looking for new music. And so they're going to re- be releasing that on um, a recording for Christmas or winter recording. And um, they were actually a Juno winning, um, Juno is the Canadian Grammys. But when they reached out about this, they hadn't won their Juno yet. But um, yeah, so that's going to give that piece and I guess me a little bit more cred in Canada. So that'll be cool. That's really cool. So what you were born in Jamaica? Do you remember anything of Jamaica? Or did they, well, I can't remember you. Uh, I don't remember being. I mean, I've been back to Jamaica, but I left before I was two. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no real memories of it. But um, it's interesting the times that I have gone back. I don't know if this is just um, yeah, it's kind of an immigrant thing, but um, there's a sense of home, even though I know that. I'm not really, you know, my cousins would say, like, you know, I'm not really a Jamaican. If you don't grow up there, I um, would hesitate to try the accent unless I'd been there a while and had it in my ear sort of thing because I just don't, you know, haven't had uh, that speech pattern. But um, there is something about the place that, you know, when I have gone there, it just kind of, there's a 
a nugget of something in your heart that gets opened up or is awakened or it calls to you in some way. So it's like your first memories. Yeah, yeah, somewhere, somewhere. So you went up to Canada and now you're in the U.S. Right. How how that transition happen? Well, um, I wanted, you know, I got into Juilliard. And then I. Let's talk, let's talk about that project. For a <laughs> second. That's a hard. That's a hard uh, accomplishment. Yeah, you know, um, my major piano teacher for most of the teacher I studied with the longest period of time. Um, her name was Alexandra Munn, and she studied at Juilliard with Erwin Fernlich, and she would always mention Mr. Fernlich this and that. And so she just decided that I should go to Juilliard. Now, I. Uh, I guess I was fairly ignorant. I had a lot of different interests. So I wasn't really a piano geek necessarily. I had a lot of things I like to do and listen to and stuff. So, and you know, you didn't just Google stuff back then because it was way back in the day. So I didn't realize how hard it was to get into Juilliard. So um, yeah, so it was like, well, you must go to Juilliard. So that's the only place I auditioned. And the first the time, only place. that's the only place I auditioned. And the, the, after I did my undergrad at the University of Alberta with, with her as my teacher as well for graduate school so the first time I didn't get in and I was like oh wait what I thought I was going to Juilliard um but um the teacher um she picked out for me again it was like I was just like okay whatever you say um um George Shondor um uh was interested in taking me as a private student and I got a grant from the Canadian government a Canada Council grant that allowed me to I want I moved to Toronto from Leduc, Alberta I was happy to get out of the small town and go to the city and um, I flew down every other week for a year, and I auditioned again. I got in, and then when it was time for me, it wasn't necessarily time for me to get a doctorate, but um, having finished the master's, um, you know, I was urged to go on and, and continue. And you know, um, I was a good student. And, you know, I mean, I picked up being like, so, <laughs> so, um, but again, I only auditioned. Juilliard for the doctoral program. And my thought back then in my youth was, well, if I don't get in, then that means I wasn't meant to get a doctorate. And if I do get in, then that means I was. So um, I was, I think, more relaxed than for any audition. I'm not someone who enjoys auditioning or, uh, you know, and uh, those sorts of things like it can freak me out as opposed to if you're playing and just sharing with people as opposed to like competing in some way, you know, that. Um, so, um, Anyway, so I got in, and I, I was just completely like, okay, I guess I'm doing a doctorate. But when I look back now, I think it was better that I didn't think, oh, wow, this is going to be super hard to get in, you know, that I was just like, okay, I'm just going to go play and, you know. See what happens. Yeah, but it was a bad, I would never at, um, advocate that sort of attitude because I think there's so many great schools in that area. If you're going to be flying to the New York area, you should audition at a bunch of places. Oh, so, absolutely. yeah, nobody else will. My lead that was out. but it, I mean I, I got a year off. I loved uh, being in Toronto and having a year in between my studies. I was a little bit burnt out. I mean I was thinking who was super gung ho about doing you know absolutely the best that I could in everything, which is good. But then yeah, I was just tired by the time I got to the end of my undergrad. So it was good for me to have a year off. It was good for me to also realize like okay, you know I I think I really do go back and do this and have a new figure about, yeah, yeah, this isn't something that I'm ready to stop the journey of learning more and exploring it. So. Tell me a little bit about uh, Juilliard. What was the challenges that you faced there? Was it, was it as easy as you think you thought of, or what was like? Oh, no, I didn't think it was yet Juilliard. I just didn't realize how hard it was to fit. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I was in a very, very small minority. I was the only black pianist most of the time. And I uh, worked in touch with a, um, his name is Major Sherlock. He came in uh, when I was already working on my dissertation. Um, and, you know, but I asked him like not that long ago because he was in uh, teaching in the pre college division. Had you seen any other black female pianists at Juilliard in all this time? And he hadn't. So I thought that was really kind of bizarre. But I mean, I had, um, and maybe it was mo mostly in my own head, but, you know, when I first was there and practicing in the practice rooms, I was. In the, in the practice room kind of, I don't know if they were scoping me out because it wasn't like any of someone knocked on the door and said, hey, welcome to Juilliard. They were just kind of like, you know, looking and listening, very competitive sort of thing. Um, but um, that was the sort of thing. I was like, 
you know, are people looking at me as a representative of like, can black people play the piano at this level? Mm. And um, so that was maybe the first year that I was a little intimidated. The second year I was able to realize that, okay, I'm here and they're here. So we're all here. And it doesn't really matter like what they are thinking. I can't control that. All I can do is try to learn as much as I can and grow as much as I can. Stay on your track. Right, exactly. I can't carry the weight of an entire race of people on my back in the sense of, you know, if I'm really good, then all black people are good. And if I'm not good, then all black people are good. That makes no sense. So I, you know, got that thought out of my head, you know, and um, kept going. But people assumed I was a singer or a dancer just because that was where most of the black people were. Who were there. And there weren't very many of us. So that was, um, that was a, a thing. That was, yeah, to me, my biggest challenge was just my own getting out of my own way and trying to navigate and get rid of the negative thoughts that just made it more stressful. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's hard to think about what other people think, but as long as you're in your own mind and stay within your own mind, mm-hmm. things get a lot easier. They, they do. I mean, obviously, when we're in music, there's, I mean, there's comparison and, oh, it's, of you know, but, but I think, yeah, you can really lose sight of um, what you're there to do. To do and to learn and to do the best that you can to channel that music and use what gift that you have been given to the best of your ability. So, and you have used that gift in many many ways. Tell me, uh, what, you have a number of achievements here on on your bio, working for like, Access, which is like uh, especially here. This is where we all went to listen to all the you know the famous recordings of classical composers. Mm-hmm. What how did those opportunities come about? You've worked at different uh, New York Philharmonic and Philadelphia orchestras. Where does this all? Well, I mean, the people who I've met uh, to collaborate with, um, I don't know. I mean, they just kind of came. I mean, when I moved to Lancaster, um, nobody knew me and I had little kids. And um, I, I'm not sure how I found out about the Lancaster Conservatory, but. Um, or maybe it was because my uh, my ex husband was teaching at Millersville, and I that I think that's where I, my introduction came. He was teaching there, and then he said, "You know, my wife is a pianist. Do you think that there's some use that you can have for her?" And then you know, submitted recordings and stuff. I said, "Oh yeah, we can find some use for her." So I think it was it was I guess through the Millersville community, and then um, you know, just having opportunities to to play here and there, and people hearing me or whatever. Um, the the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, uh, it was because of um, uh, Donna Burkholder, her daughter, is a violinist who I, mm. I assume is still playing there. And so I knew Donna Burkholder, and that's how I got connected with her daughter. And um, then also um, New Yorkville is um, my friend Sarah Mail, who, with whom I collaborated a number of times. And she and I and Doris have also played together. Um, her husband plays viola in the New Yorkville. So that was how I was connected. Um, but I mean, uh, while I will say that a lot of music I discovered is marketing, <laughs> you know, I mean, like putting things out there, um, whether it's, you know, YouTube videos or finding churches or organizations that have concert series and trying to interest them in having you do things. Um, you know, I've gotten a fair amount of things from, you know, whatever I put out there and so much telling somebody or hearing me and you know but yeah that was that was a thing that they didn't really stress when I was at Juilliard I think now they do more of that which is that okay so you're gonna have to find a venue and put on your own concert and do some something for yourself and you know all that sort of stuff um I think it's a much more realistic view other than just okay well go into your practice room and play really well and everything will fall into place or win a competition you know go the competition route and you know I mean yeah, for some people, but for a lot of us now, really. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A part of being a musician is being a business person as well. Absolutely. Because if you can be great at music, but if no one hears about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and anything that involves an aspect of freelance, that's the whole thing. You have to be prepared for the um, parts that are unpredictable. You know, financially unpredictable. I mean, I've had a, a job at St. Thomas Episcopal Church for longer than I 
should really care to admit, but you know, it's not about not care to admit, but it just seems like the time has gone by and I look at the number, I'm like, oh my goodness, like 20 years, you know, and um, having that anchor both as a, uh, you know, spiritually, as a family atmosphere, like it's, a, it's, I know some people have had bad experiences working in churches anytime you get a bunch of people together and it can happen. But, um, you know, but my experience has been almost uh, completely just wonderful. And um, it's been something that, yeah, definitely was an anchor. I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose some people have a, a large studio or whatever, but it's really hard to have just a form of performer and, you know, especially with kids. Mm. Yeah. Is that something you uh, want to move into as well, like a teaching role or for the kids? Oh, um, well, I meant with having kids. Oh, I see. Having of course, yes. Kids. Yeah, I've, I've taught since I was 13 years old, which is kind of insane. It is kind of insane. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I was, I, I went rather quickly in the beginning, so I was quite a bit more advanced than the beginners I was teaching, and I was tall. And, you know, my mom is was a music teacher, and she would, you know, sort of sit outside or listen in on the lessons and stuff like that. But, um, and, you know, as far as jobs go, I suppose when you're 13, there aren't too many jobs you can do, really, you know. But, I mean, when I look back on it now, I can't imagine having a 13-year-old teaching even my beginning kid. But I've, I've done it continuously. Since, so. What are some things that you've learned about teaching that, uh, on one side, you are being a teacher, but on the other side, you've been taught by a high-level musician? What are, what are some things that... You would like to translate from those high level teachings into maybe the average studio teacher here like um well i don't know that i want to tell people how, how they should be teaching but oh, i mean i do think that um so much there's so much psychology you mm -hmm. know i mean like just trying to find out what a particular student is going to relate to and um you know i, I found that the more um more technique that i uh the more that, you know, I could try to look for certain things, you know, early on. I mean, it's hard to absolutely, especially when kids are not sure they're really committed. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's only so much you can do. I mean, there are things that, you know, I'll, I'll tell them what matter now, but, you know, but I mean, I mean, the basic thing is that you play the piano with your fingers. So what you do with your hands, your fingers, arms, everything um, can affect how easy or difficult it is which is something that you may not notice at the beginning. But, um, yeah, I mean, I hope that um, in addition to having a bar set for themselves that allows them to feel like they have achieved some sort of mastery, you know, like um, that they do continue to feel or, or learn to have a love of music as a self-expression. You talk, your thing's called the story. I mean, like the idea of being able to tell a story in music you know, and, you know, why do we play things loud or soft? Why do we want to um, try to um, compel people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when, then compel yourself, first of all, like, you know, find out, you know, it's not just I'm playing the notes and rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, and, but if I learn to play the notes and rhythm, then I can do something really cool. So, um, you know, step one, step two, and try to incorporate them as much as possible. But yeah, as I said, each kid is a, is a, is a <laughs> puzzle. So, you just you, well, uh, I teach children how to swim. Yes. Oh, okay. So it's a whole, yeah, whole extra layer to that one. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, but it's a lot of fun, and, and you know, the main thing I would say is to make sure you're always encouraged. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I will always try to find something good to say about what they did, even if it's that they, I, that I know they can do better because I've seen them. You know, I know what you can oh, do. Yeah, so making sure because sometimes they'll they'll be. Like, uh, uh, feign ignorance and then no, I see you do this before. You, you can do that, right? Or, right. You know, or that, they get a little yeah passionate about it, or or that week. You know, I mean, I'll ask. You know, is everything okay? Like, was it a really busy week? And I can come in and have really done anything. So I'll start with that, and then you know, go with well, you know, I've seen what you can do, so I know that you know, I'm only asking you to do this because I know you can, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, you know that I believe in them. Uh, so we have all of your pieces that I'd love to get to. This is one okay. of the first pieces you've, you were written uh, at 14 Mills. Would you like to elaborate on it? Yeah. <clears throat> so recess. Um, I wrote a set called um, Nautical Glimpses, which was N-A-U-G-H-E-Y, 
mm-hmm. Kale glimpses, Kale's of a kindergarten class. And uh, that was um, kind of my final assignment or something with my year of composition. And um, so these are supposed to be scenes from a kindergarten class, um, these four different little vignettes. So that piece last about a minute. Yeah, so what is this piece trying to elaborate on, do you think? Uh, kids, little kids running around in the playground, maybe teasing each other. And then at the end, there's something that's supposed to sound like a bell calling them in. And then they all just run back into the building. Oh, let's see what you can imagine. With this piece. out of style does it (laughs) yeah that's awesome and uh so there's four four other pieces of that well there's three others um the first one is the early morning march which um i was assigned to write something in the style of procopia so to me it's supposed to sound like trudging through the snow first thing in the morning i wasn't Mm. like a morning person and growing up in western canada there was some trudging through the snow (laughs) uh yeah and then the second one um is um that one and then no wait which was what's the order i should remember um then teacher tells a mythical tale is, is the third one i believe and that one is um you know meant to be sort of once upon a time sounding and a little bit slower and um mystical and then the last one is skipping home so yeah it's so interesting at 14 you're, you're employing a lot of uh contemporary music compositional stuff it's not much classical at all, it's more of a, what is it called? Postmodern theory, a little bit. Maybe. I don't know that I was thinking of that. <laughs> well, of course, right. It, um, but it, it's still so interesting how it, how it, it flows. It makes sense as, as a piece. It's it's like, uh, I'm literally forgetting all of the composers in all of my history. Mm-hmm. But it's very much, it's very much of that uh, contemporary style where it's, it's, it's not very classical. Uh, but it's it's programmatic. It makes sense, and it flows correctly, even though you're not following rules. Well, I mean, I think the rules. Like, what are the rules? I mean, like, <laughs> right. you know, because I mean, like, sonata form. Okay, people were writing a certain way, and someone said, "What are they doing?" Oh, let's break it down and call it sonata form. And then right. once you codified it, then everybody's breaking the rules. Right, that people are like, okay, well, this is sort of not a form, but then it's kind of doing this, and you know. So I think that, um, and also the idea of being influenced by things like what is classical music? I mean, we're mm-hmm. thinking Western European classical music is has is something that's always drawn from what was around. If you're talking about um, um, Bach, even in his suite and the dance forms that are in the suite, well, where were the dancers coming from? Right, from classical music well no those are the things that people were doing that was the popular music of the right. time you know hungarian rhapsody which is you know trying to uh you know fake um roma the music of the roma people or something so i think i think that um i think we you know in trying to put barriers or definitions on this is jazzy this is classical. i mean it's not that your ears won't say okay this sounds more like classical music than hip-hop you know but then people combine, have combined the two with of that as well. And you have operas and different things that draw on that. I mean, I, I've done that, you know. And so I, I don't know. I, I just feel like making these divisions, I think they're artificial. To me, if music speaks to me in some way, you know, if I have a, an emotional reaction to it, you know, I'm not thinking, well, I should like this because it's this category and I'm supposed to be a higher plane or something or, you know, or that music is so pretentious i shouldn't like it like you know sometimes i I gave a talk um a number of years ago um 
at a Christmas Addicts, and it was uh, contemporary music for urban kids, and the word urban is kind of used differently now, but back when I did it, that seemed like an appropriate thing to call it. And um, so, um, you know, I came in and the man was like, are you gonna rap? I said, nah, you don't want to rap. So I, I played a number of different pieces. I played, I even chanced to play Shuma's Traumarai, which it was really warm, there was no air conditioning. So I think that was a really dangerous thing to do if I wanted my audience to stay awake. But um, I played a number of different pieces. And um, my point was that all emotion, all humans have emotions and how we express it is like different languages. So if I say, I love you in French or I say it in Swahili or whatever the language is that I choose, it's just as valid an expression of emotion. So music is the same way. So I was saying, you know, don't put yourself in a box because people tell you you should like this or like that. I mean, you don't have to like it. But I think that, you know, the idea that well, I don't like this because I'm whoever I am or I should like it because I'm whoever I am. I think that's just, you know, allowing others who I said, really, most of the people that are your friends right now, and these are, you know, kids in grade in elementary school, I hate to tell you this, but a lot of these people you will just not even know. So to let those people determine what it is that you enjoy, I mean, I, I just don't think that's, that makes a lot of sense. And so afterwards, a couple of people came up to me and said, um, no, I, I really like the Moonlight Sonata. You know, like, you're all quiet. You know, like, you're not supposed to let anybody know. But um, anyway. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you, for sure. Mm -hmm. Don't let, just because you're, you're a rapper, doesn't mean you can't like country music or you can't like whatever else. I mean, it's like Nelly in uh, Florida Georgia Line. I'm not a I'm not a big country listener, so I don't know a lot of the people. But I'm aware of like, it doesn't make sense that there are whole categories of people to do no musical gifts. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like you know, in the we go back to Western classical music. You know, like all these black composers who I'm now um, championing more. You know, recording um, music with black women. I mean, Florence Price died a long time ago. Her music is not better than it was before she died. It's just that people are taking the time to listen to it and give her, um, you know, and discover it. And before it was just dismissed out of hand because of who she was. Um, and I think like it was in, in, as I said, all kinds of directions. There are creativity is not confined to any one group and great creativity is not confined to any one group. Some people have more access to mm. training and whatever, but um, I don't think, you know, greatness to any, you know, any people. Let's say a, a great dip of, of a chameleon that kind of molds to a lot of different genres is Elton John. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah he, you know, he's played with Tupac. He's played with... When I first heard this is a track with Tupac, I was like... Whoa. I've never heard it. No, I uh, Ghetto Gospel. It's oh. It's called Ghetto Gospel. And wow. uh, it's a track with Tupac. And when I first heard it, I was like, okay, that's Tupac. I'm vibing. And then I heard Elton John's voice. I'm like, wait, hold, hold, hold on a second. So this was something while Tupac was alive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I was I was blown away. I was, there's no wow. way. And then, you know, he does something with Britney Spears now. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, I heard that. And all these other different artists. And it's just like, wow, that's a range. And that's that's not caring. Yeah. And and I don't and I don't think you should. Oh, I mean, sure. you mentioned um interesting snarky puppy and you mentioned that they had performed with Yoma Yuma, Yuma and I think he's someone who also has extended um you know to world music or whatever just you know wanted to do different things outside of just the niche that he had carved for himself and yeah I think that that's that's great I mean you have one life to live if you're a curious musician I wouldn't you? I wouldn't exactly yeah. right and don't let other people hold you back for what you want to do no that's the way music progresses anyway. Exactly. Yep. We have some of your more recent work. We have uh, Lucid Dreaming. Would okay. you like to talk about this? Yeah. Okay. So um, I mentioned that I um, recorded a recent um, album, if they call them albums anymore, of music by Black women uh, for piano. And um, I had done one in 2006. Uh, and I figured I'd probably never record another uh, CD or whatever because um, it's really expensive. Like they don't pay you. <laughs> I mean, unless it's maybe you're project. super fit. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, but the thing was, um, I had no performances because of the pandemic. And I had all this music that I had bought and had never learned because, you know, I mean, you kind of do things that like I have projects and you have concerts coming up and to learn something new that um, might be a little bit challenging. You're like, well, I have to, which time do I have? Okay, well, maybe I won't learn that. Anyway, um, I went, 
I went to those files and somebody had reached out to me. His name is um, Jared Oaks. And um, he was familiar with another CD that I had done of music by Leslie Adams, who is an African-American composer. Yeah. And he uh, invited me to, um, you know, he said, if you need any help on a project, you know, I'll try to help you. Anyway, I cut to the chase. I decided to write a piece for myself since I was thinking mm -hmm. of myself as a composer. So I, figured I should include some of my own music if I'm going to record other people's music. So long introduction, lucid dreaming, because I used to have lucid dreams about flying because it was difficult to fly, but, you know, 